Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Our scripture today comes from Genesis chapter 9, verse 8 through 17. It's the story of God setting the rainbow as a covenant uh, between himself and humanity. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant I am making between you and me and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it, and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. May God add his blessing to our reading and hearing and understanding of his word. We're going to dive into this passage uh, this morning and uh, go back a, a little bit into uh, the first part of Genesis. We're only in the ninth chapter of Genesis and already a whole bunch of things have, have taken place. But when we talk about rainbows, one of the places my mind goes is the story of the Wizard of Oz and the, the wonderful song out of that movie, uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I grew up watching that, uh, that movie. Uh, I think it used to come on like once or twice a year. Our family would sit around the TV and watch it. Uh, the scene where uh, the monkeys are flying and capturing Dorothy uh, was probably when I was little the scariest thing uh, that I could see. Um, and uh, I, I think I still have nightmares over monkeys flying and carrying me off. So the movie debuted in 1939. That doesn't quite seem possible. It won the Oscar in 1940. A fellow by the name of Yip Harburg wrote the words and Harold Arlen wrote the score to Somewhere Over the Rainbow. In 2001, Somewhere Over the Rainbow was, uh, won an award as the greatest song of the 20th century by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Recording Industry Association of America. The song has just enormous appeal and sort of uh, cap 
capitalizes uh, all of the, uh, the images and thoughts of the movie, the whole story of, of hope. The lyrics uh, written by Harburg, uh, he was the son of a Russian Jewish immigrant and an Orthodox Jew. And so 1939, uh, a whole lot of bad stuff was happening in, in Europe uh, and had to be partly in the, the background of Harburg's uh, writing this story as news of concentration camps and, and the treatment of the Jews uh, began to sweep over the world. The song is about hope that even as bad as times get, uh, it will be over. This feeling of hope within the song that we can all relate to is a story of hope that helped the Jewish people uh, through the Holocaust. One of the prisoners of war that survived the concentration camps was a fellow by the name of Viktor Frankl who uh, wrote a book after uh, World War II called Man's Search for Meaning. And he chronicles in that book the story of why some people survived in the camps and some people didn't. And he says that those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. And so that, that image is kind of uh, wrapped up in, in this song and in this story. The lyrics talk about hope, about longing, about dreams, about someday I'll reach my goal. Someday I'll realize. Someday I'll attain. Someday I'll arrive. But it also has this air of, of uh, unsure and anxiety about it as well. Birds fly over the rainbow. Why can't I? Why then can't I? What's holding me back is a question that's, that's part of the story. And it's not only part of the Wizard of Oz and not only part of the part of the story of Somewhere Over the Rainbow, but it's also part of the scripture that we read today. What's, what's going on in this ninth chapter of Genesis? What's going on with this story of a rainbow? Why, why are we at that place? Because Eden, the Garden of Eden, was just a minute ago. Uh, in terms of the story, we're nine chapters in, and already the world mostly is destroyed by this flood. What happened? What went wrong? Uh, how did uh, everything come off the rail so quickly? As, as Noah and his family step off of the ark onto solid land, they're desperate for hope for a way forward, for what's going to happen, for where do we go from here, for some sort of sign. And so that's where God comes to talk with Noah. But it's not just a conversation between God and Noah. It's a conversation between God and all of humanity. It's a conversation that, that transcends the book of Genesis and is part of the whole story of humanity. Who are we? Where are we going? How do we get there? What does it take? What are the foundational elements? And, and that's what we have here in this story and in this first few chapters of Genesis. In every generation, we need hope. In every generation, we need direction. In every generation, we need a sign. In every generation, we need a path. We need some guide for the journey that, that we're on. And so Genesis is foundational to this journey, this discovery, this search, this quest. Genesis sets the markers. It tells us what to look for. It trains our eyes and our ears on how to discover God in the midst of the noise and the chaos and the confusion of whatever day, whatever time we find ourselves in. It gives us a map of what to look for and how to navigate the struggle of life. In the first nine chapters here in Genesis, we have creation, we have banishment, we have destruction, and then now we have this new creation, this new covenant. Um, and there'll be a number of covenants and, and uh, conversations that God has with people uh, in these first few books of the Bible. The conversation here between God and Noah is a marker. It's a line drawn in the sand. The, the, the question is still 
uh, being discussed at this point is to what's God's intent and what's the way forward? Uh, is God just going to get angry and destroy life and start all over repeatedly uh, so that we're always on edge, just unsure of what to do and what not to do because we're terrified of God? Or is, is there a new path that's charted? So this is a critical juncture. It's a critical time frame and, and marks uh, the, what's going to happen the whole rest of the way. And so is God going to destroy the world over and over again, or is God going to find a path to redemption? And so we find here that God chooses the latter. God chooses grace. God chooses mercy. God chooses a relationship. God chooses redemption. And here in this ninth chapter of Genesis, this question is answered for forever and always. And once the choice is made that God is going to strive with, contend with, uh, be frustrated by, but still work with humanity, the question then becomes how? How is that going to take place? What is that going to look like? What is redemption look like? How do we get back to the garden? How will God and humans coexist and interact and get along? So the questions are, what's the plan? What's God's part? What's our part? Well, to answer these questions, we need to dive a little bit uh, into the book of Genesis and go back a few chapters because God's setting this all up in a couple of conversations that he has with characters uh, in the garden. Something happens in the garden, and the whole rest of the Bible is helping us understand who we are and where our journey is taking us. So let's, let's look at a, a couple of conversations that take place. The first one happens in Genesis chapter 3, verse 11, where Adam and Eve have eaten the apple and have discovered that they're naked. So when God comes for his daily walk, they're hiding because they're naked. God says, where are you? And Adam and Eve say, we're hiding. And uh, God says, why? They say, because we're naked. And God then says in verse 11, chapter 3, verse 11 of Genesis, who told you that you were naked? And so the question becomes, who are we listening to? And there's a thousand voices in our heads right now with social media and news and books and friends and uh, different places where we go to get information. How do we know who to listen to? And that's God's question. Who are you listening to? Are you listening to voices that guide you and draw you closer to me? Or are you listening to voices that distract you and take you away and tempt you and uh, tell you lies? And so the question all the way through the Bible and, and one to watch as you read the stories is, who were they listening to that they acted that way? When you read a story and people just do some crazy thing, who were they listening to? Who told them to do that? Who told them that that was okay? Where did they get that idea? And it might help us when we uh, read the Bible that way to say, you know, maybe I sometimes listen to voices like that. Maybe I do that too. Maybe, maybe I need to pay less attention to that voice and more attention to God. And where do I hear God's voice the best? And maybe I ought to spend some more time there. So who do you listen to? Who is speaking to you? Who is giving you advice and direction? And where do you find the voice of God today? Second question conversation that's worth noting is uh, in Genesis chapter 4 verses 6 through 7 and it's a question of how do we find our way in the world today and it's it's probably the most loving pastoral conversation seen in the whole Bible uh, maybe in all of literature where uh, Cain and Abel have presented their uh, their sacrifices to God Abel's sacrifice has been uh, noted as worthy, and Cain's not so much. And so Cain is off sulking. 
I, I imagine he's sitting on a rock or a ledge somewhere and he's just mad, his head's down, he's downcast, he, he, uh, he's jealous of Abel and he's not sure what to do. And so God comes alongside of him. And, and in my mind, God sits down next to him, puts his arm around Cain and says, Cain, buddy. And the conversation goes like this in Genesis 4, 6 to 7. Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. It's just such an incredible scene that Genesis uh, paints here of God's love, his compassion, his encouragement, uh, but also the boundaries that God has uh, that, are, that are very clear. Cain, why are you angry? Why are you downcast? You did something, it didn't go right, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, come on, we can, we can work on this. We can learn. We can have a conversation. We'll talk. We'll get it right. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, but don't just go away and sulk and be angry. That's, that's not a way forward because you need to know that this is a part of your character. And if you don't get this right, a lot of life won't go right for you. And tragically, that's exactly what happens over the next few verses. Cain does some really bad stuff. He kills his brother. So how are we going to navigate the struggles and battles of life? How are we going to do that? Who are we going to listen to? And then what are the resources that we have at our disposal that can get us on the right track? How are we going to handle uh, uh, disappointment? How are we going to handle when things don't go our way? Are we just going to get mad and get angry? Or are we going to find a way through it and, and forward? Are we going to uh, compartmentalize it and, and just pretend that it doesn't exist? Are we going to learn and grow from it? And so that's all part of this journey, this, this journey of discovering a voice, this journey of discovering how we're going to navigate in life. And then the final question or conversation is, it happens in Genesis 3, 23, when God, because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, he banishes them from the garden. He says, you're going to have to leave. Uh, and so the question then is, okay, if we're leaving the garden, then where are we going? And we're going to see that struggle all through the Old and New Testament as people try to figure out where to go. Abraham follows God to a land that he doesn't know because God says, here's where I want you to go. Here's where I'm leading you. Here's where I'm taking you. Uh, in the journey through the desert to the promised land, God is providing a place, but they, they're on a journey to get there. It's going to take some time and it's going to take some discipline on their life. Uh, in the latter part of the Old Testament, people are trying to find uh, their way through the nations and, and uh, uh, relationships that they have with each other. When we get into the New Testament, Jesus is going to change the conversation a little bit. He's going to say, follow me. He's not going to point or tell them a direction. He's going to say, come on, let me, let me show you where, where we're going. He's going to take them there. So all of this is in the backdrop of this Sunday. This Sunday is the first Sunday of Lent. And this scripture passage is given us in the lectionary uh, as part of the church's um, conversation about this journey to find our place with God. And this story of this covenant and the backdrop of Genesis is all part of the story of uh, inviting us along in a journey with God to discover who we're going to listen to, how we're going to get there, and where it is that we're going. So Lent is an invitation to this journey for 40 days between uh, this past Ash Wednesday and Easter is a time of discovery. It's a time of searching. It's a time of, of uh, connecting and, and praying and a, a, a time of uh, asking God sort of a checkup of where are we, whether you're 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years old, and you've been at this for a year, two years, 100 years, where are you in your relationship with God? Are you making progress? Are, are you growing? Are you further down the road than you were a year ago? So Lent is an invitation to walk, to examine, to consider 
If we go back to the Wizard of Oz and the story of the, the song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, that, that Dorothy sings in, in the song, it's a, it's a time of discovery. And Dorothy is on her own journey, isn't she? Uh, she's frustrated with the way things are at home. She's trying to find a better life. Uh, she sets out to uh, find a new way. And, and so this story is about that journey. And so on the journey, who is she going to listen to? As she gets into Oz, there are all kinds of people and new voices speaking to tell her, go this way or that way or do this or don't do that or, or stay away from this or go into this place. And so she has to discern who to listen to. Who is the voice of reason? Who is the voice of wisdom? Who will she listen to? The how, the how of how we get there and how we fight off uh, the temptations in life is, is so wonderfully illustrated in the characters of the lion and the scarecrow and the tin man. The lion in his search for courage and how courage guides us and gives us the strength we need. Uh, the scarecrow looking for wisdom or brains uh, so that the scarecrow can make decisions and, and uh, be of help to other people. And it's tin man uh, wanting, longing for a heart, a heart that gives uh, purpose and direction and compassion for other people. See, when we focus on our gifts and the blessings in our lives, when we focus on the Holy Spirit that's in us, guiding and directing us, when we uh, rely on the power of God to get us from point A to point B, we find we do have the resources that we need for the journey. We don't have to fall into fear. We don't have to uh, abdicate the, the decisions in our lives to other people or other things or listen to the crowd. We can go in the direction that God is calling us because we have the power and the strength of God at work in us. And then finally, Dorothy is concerned about home. How do I get home? Well, first you have to decide where home is. Uh, at one part of the story, she was looking for life and hope and meaning out there somewhere. And then she realizes later on that it's not out there, that it's with the people that are part of the journey with her. And so how does she reconnect with them? And how do we do that during Lent? Maybe as we enter this season of Lent, we're estranged from some family members or some friends or some folks that we work with? How do we repair those relationships? Maybe we're estranged in our relationship with God. Maybe we've neglected the, the spiritual connection, the connection with God. Maybe we've run from God's voice. We've trusted in our own voice, in our own way, and now we know, we realize we need to listen to God's voice, but we don't know what that voice sounds like anymore. How do we find it? For we all long for what only God has to offer. God is calling people all throughout history, calling so that we can discover that hope. But not just to hold on to that hope. The, the discovery that we find in our faith is not, a, is not a search for something that then we put in a box and hoard and, and, and sort of put on a shelf and look at every once in a while. It's a, it's a discovery that once we find it, we're so enamored with it and so uh, blessed by it that we want to share it, that we want the whole world to know. In Genesis, back in, in Genesis, again, in the 12th chapter, the third verse, uh, God's call to Abraham. God says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and all of your people so that you all can be a blessing to the world. So that as I pour into you wisdom and knowledge and understanding and gifts, you can share that knowledge and that understanding and those gifts with the whole world. It's not for you to keep for yourself. It's for you to share, to be a blessing, to be generous with all that I give you. And so... When we get to the New Testament, again, Jesus is saying, follow me. Uh, the question of where are we going is, is posed to Jesus right away. The disciples want to know where he's staying, where his home is. And he says, come and I'll, I'll show you. Follow me. So in the New Testament, we don't have somebody 
uh, pointing direction or telling us to go to this land or that land as we do in the Old Testament, what we have in the New Testament is a guide. And that guide promises to be with us throughout all life and all generations and all eternity, to guide us, to lead us, to walk with us, to be a part of the journey with us so that God is found not out there somewhere, but inside in our hearts, in our lives, uh, that, that discovery that God is here and not out there. This rainbow marks the choice that God makes in the ninth chapter of Genesis, not to destroy, but to redeem. And so from Genesis 9 through Revelation 22, we see this plan unfold of how God has redeemed us, how God is redeeming us, how God is calling us, how God is gifting us, how God is with us in good times and bad how God is guiding us through the pits and the valleys, putting the pieces of the puzzle together. A new heaven and a new earth. The kingdom of God realized not something down the road, not something we enter into after we die, but something that's here, that's real, that's now. So I'm inviting you this Lent. Maybe something we've talked about this morning has resonated. Maybe spending some more time with who. Who am I listening to? And how do I more firmly grasp the voice of God in my life? What are the resources that I have at my disposal? Or maybe the question for you this Lent is, how do I get a handle on the destructive forces in my life? That may be like Cain, you're angry and you're sullen and you're dark and you're disappointed with where life has brought you to this point and the temptation to uh, just let that spiral out of control is very real. God is coming alongside of you, even sitting on the ledge with you with his arm around you saying, don't go that way, but trust in me, follow me, come with me and I'll show you a better way. As we head for home, as we enter this journey of Lent together, I invite you to pray for your family, for your your friends here at church, for our nation and for our world, as people find their path back to God. Let us pray. God, so often we miss your voice, we miss your, your call. We miss the subtle ways in which you reach out to us. We're, we're busy or distracted or think we know better. We ask your forgiveness. And this Lent, maybe we need, we need you to be a little louder or we need to be a little quieter so that we don't miss your voice, so that we don't miss the signs, so that we don't misinterpret how you're calling us and how you're leading us. I'm thankful for your church for so many wonderful folks that help this place of community and faith give life. Guide us, God. Empower us to be your people. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 1115 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online 
but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.